So, uh, good afternoon, and I would like to start by thanking Brooke uh, for organizing the session and inviting me to present a paper here. So I will focus on some selected aspects of uh, encounters with Roman imperialism uh, based on two case studies located in their respective northern fringes. Just some very quick general remarks at the beginning, and uh, I don't have time here to expand this further, but maybe later in the discussion. Uh, frontiers uh, can be defined as liminal spaces of interaction, and they are crucial for the construction of uh, various levels of nested identities, so at different scales. Um, for my case study, we'll be focusing on the pressure from uh, imperial powers, in this case, the expanding Roman Empire, that uh, can play a major role in the construction of frontier identities, that identities that are very much shaped by resistance to these external uh, pressures. And in this sense, what I'm uh, dealing with here are, could be defined as borderlands, so contact zone between different polities, asymmetrical polities, uh, and in a way spaces in between that are in a more or less direct contact with an expanding power for <coughs> several generations, but gen uh, also uh, having dynamics of resistance against this power. So I will be focusing uh, on my two examples here, Northern Gaul and Northern Iberia uh, in the first century BC. Uh, but before moving into these examples, uh, some words about the concept of resistance. This is uh, obviously a very broad term that uh, has uh, been used in a rather loose way as all uh, important concepts are subject to debate and we will probably not agree on one single definition. But I found uh, Alfredo gonzalez Rubal book on an archaeology of resistance very inspiring. And uh, I mean, he's focusing mostly on Africa, but he has also some more general remarks about the concept of resistance. And in particular, he, he tries to uh, distinguish between uh, resilience, resistance, and rebellion. And he provides some definitions uh, in his introduction. Uh, in the case of resilience, uh, according to him, uh, it will be the capacity to adapt psychologically and socially to powers through the development of cultural coping mechanisms. Uh, whereas rebellion is usually violent and heavily politicized. Resilience can uh, potentially happen all the time, whereas rebellions uh, tend to explode in particular time moments. Uh, expanding this further, resilience uh, often works at an unconscious level, but nevertheless, uh, it has real implications in people's lives and how they sh uh, shape their identities. And to give some examples uh, of the ranges that we can see in episodes of resistance, uh, we have from subtle resistance to open war scenarios. For example, in the 17th century, the Pueblo Revolt in the, in the US represents an example of resistance to colonial rule that combines different strategies, accommodation, rebellion, and revitalization. There has also been some discussion on so-called nativistic movements, uh, defined as a periods of massive social stress that leads to attempts to restore <coughs> group self-consciousness in the face of an alien culture, an external culture that is perceived as threatening, and historical examples uh, that have been classified within this uh, category, the Mau Mau movement in Kenya in the 20th century, or closer to my own er uh, area of study, the Batavian revolt in the Lower Rhine in the first century AD that some uh, Dutch colleagues have classified as a nativistic movement. So a uh, recent narrative uh, on uh, uh, Roman imperialism uh, have uh, put quite a lot of attention on social discrepancy. Uh, of course, social discrepancy emphasizing a conscious agency of indigenous communities and individuals <coughs> and a selective adaptation, uh, uh, adoption of new elements. And there's a lot uh, there are a lot of positive aspects in this in these views that have helped to overcome some shortages and biases from earlier research, most notably attributing agency to, uh, to indigenous communities and not see them just as passive recipients from external uh, external uh, uh, new elements. But at the same time, uh, in some cases this has led to a rather benign conceptual of colonial and imperial power that. Uh, consciously or unconsciously can underplay the more brutal repressive aspects in this case of Roman imperialism. And we should never forget the power relationships encountered with the Roman of these communities in Western Central Europe with the Roman world were, were marked by a 
a huge political asymmetry. So celebration of multiculturalism, negotiation of fluid identities uh, in the Roman world uh, should not let us forget that uh, there were strategies of oppression or even episodes of mass murder and enslavement. Looking at uh, uh, resistance to Roman expansion, we can distinguish different, different types of resistance uh, also associated to different temporalities uh, before the Roman, before the actual war, uh, where we see in, among certain communities strategies of resilience and resistance during the war itself and also after with uh, processes, uh, strategies of resilience and moments of rebellion. Uh, I would like to highlight that I'm here focusing mostly on, on communities that try, uh, actively resisted in one way or the other the expanding Roman power. There were obviously also uh, many communities, many individuals within communities that um, uh, had close contacts uh, with uh, Roman power from the time before the conquest, uh, adopting numerous elements and uh, regions where the conquest was not as violent as in others. So I'm more focusing here on the uh, on the negative side, on the more brutal side, but without forgetting that there are also other scenarios. So my case studies, and because time is short, I will go very briefly through them, are Northern Gaul, uh, particularly during the period of the Caesarean conquest in the 50s BC, and Northern Iberia uh, during the Augustan conquest between 29 and 19 BC. Uh, starting with the pre-conquest period, uh, in Northern Gaul, uh, we see a very interesting uh, phenomenon of uh, what I would call ideological rejection of uh, imports or uh, also uh, ex certain external technologies. Uh, this, for example, is a distribution map of Roman amphora, and it's, uh, it's very clear to see that uh, this uh, finds a uh, concentrate on the southern regions <coughs> of Northern Gaul but not found in the north. The dots that you see found in the north, they are already from the post-conquest period, mostly associated to Roman military uh, establishment. But before the uh, Caesarean conquest, we see a almost complete absence of Mediterranean imports, <laughs> Roman imports, uh, in, the, uh, in the northern part of this region. Uh, for a long time, many scholars have interpreted this as these communities not having access to these products because <coughs> of trade routes or because of the nature, or the nature of the exchanges. I would rather see this as a conscious rejection uh, that is based on the ideology of these communities. So this map is a reflection of the agency of local societies rather than not being able to have access to these products. Uh, these communities in the north, they don't have Roman amphora, for, but on the other side, they have a huge amount of glass bracelets uh, in the first century BC. And we know now, thanks to some uh, scientific studies carried out by Dutch colleagues, that the raw material for these glass bracelets came from the Near East. So they were involved in very long distance uh, exchange networks, directly or indirectly, but they didn't have Roman amphora. Why? Well, uh, looking at Caesar, sometimes it's useful. And although there's a lot of distortion and propaganda in his account, I think there's also some stuff that we can uh, find as very useful and reflecting, to a certain extent, uh, local realities. Uh, speaking about this area, in particular the, the area of the Nervi in Northern Gaul, he states that traders had no means of access unto them, for they allowed no wine nor any of the other appurtenances of luxury to be imported, because they supposed that their spirit was likely to be enfeebled and the courage relaxed thereby. So we, what we seem to have here is a conscious reaction by those communities that saw that this external element could be a threat to their ways of life, to the codes of value, and so on. And actually, it's a similar quote uh, uh, from Caesar about the, the Suebi on the uh, eastern side of the Rhine. Uh, but amphora, uh, Roman amphora, are just one element in this region in general. This is the northern periphery, so outside this distribution map of wheel made pottery. We see a very late beginning of coin production, and where we have coins are mostly gold coins. Uh, so not the kind of potting coins that we find for economic transactions in other areas of gold. Of gold. We see a virtual absence of Mediterranean imports, an overwhelming predominance of handmade pottery, whereas neighboring communities were producing wheel-turn pottery on a large scale. So we seem to have communities that, uh, with an ideology resistant to introducing numerous external innovations, and also principles of moral economy that were aimed to limit the concentration of power in the hands of a single person or family group. And we have also a quote about the Ambioris king of the Burones, who stated that his power was 
uh, not to have more uh, power than people over him, but also not more. So a kind of negotiated, um, very negotiated power structures. Uh, moving to northern Iberia, uh, in the so-called Cantabrian fronte, uh, we see that um, we have communities that were living in direct contact with uh, territories conquered by Rome for several generations. Uh, but at the same time, they, we have no Roman amphora, nearly no coins or other products before the military conquest. Um, this Cantabrian area uh, was the last part of Iberia that was incorporated into Roman rule. And it, this conquest took place nearly 200 years after the Romans started conquering the Iberian Peninsula, moving from the Mediterranean coast into the central north areas. Uh, again, I will claim that these communities in the Cantabrian fringes uh, uh, were consciously resisting Roman influence uh, for several decades before the actual war started and they were falsely incorporated into the empire. Um, we have some pre, uh, pre-conquest confrontations that are mentioned in written sources. Uh, Roman sources speak about frequent raids of these communities to the Duero Valley. Uh, to what extent this is reflecting reality or is part of imperial justification is debatable. I think probably there was a combination of both elements, but what we need to be very aware is the Romans were creating a narrative of preventive war that justified uh, their forced annexation of these communities. Moving into the uh, moment of actual war, military conquest, uh, in Northern Gaul, uh, uh, some colleagues, for example, uh, Nico Reumanns have claimed that we can identify some uh, episodes of genocide uh, in this area. Genocide is a strong word that has many connotations and is debatable, but in any case, what we do see here are episodes of mass murder and enslavement. Caesar's narrative is obviously imbued by this personal propaganda and wider rhetorics of imperial ideology, but there's no doubt that his conquest in Gaul had dramatic consequences. Uh, and I think modern scholars have sometimes underestimated, uh, underestimated this. Appian, for example, claims that Caesar killed one million Gauls and enslaved another million out of a population of four million. Uh, even if these figures might be exaggerated, <laughs> if you only take the half of them or one third, it's still an enormous amount uh, comparable, uh, if not more, than the number of casualties and people directly affected during the, during the world wars in the 20th, in 20th century Europe. Uh, some lo- some uh, uh, Gallic communities, particularly in the northern fringes that I'm discussing here, offered fierce resistance. Uh, and um, and uh, Rome reacted in a very violent way against this resistance. In the case of the Burones, Caesar uh, declares that the race and name of that people should be annihilated, destroyed. So this uh, a conscious, uh, at least in narrative, uh, decision to really exterminate this population. Uh, there must have been a huge impact on the landscape since uh, the campaigns against the Burones uh, took place uh, during uh, uh, several years against a population that was dispersed uh, over the countryside of a large territory. So this is something very different from when the Romans attack one single fortified place and they defeat them. Here we have a dispersed population. And thinking about the impact that this could have had on the landscapes, we can look, for example, a later testimony from the Marcomannic Wars. We see here... Uh, representation of or an a column uh, that describes this war where we have Roman soldiers burning down uh, local villages, uh, killing people, and so on. So in a way, we can uh, think of this as landscapes of war and terror, to use the title of a book by Helen Willeman. Uh, the strategy derived, uh, described by Roman sources uh, states that troops were moving through the homeland of enemy tribes, burning down settlements, destroying crops in the field, murdering <coughs> inhabitants. So really a dramatic impact on native populations. Archaeology can play an important role here by looking, for example, at discontinuity of settlement in settlement patterns, looking at the demographic impact on the, of the conquest, also through em- environmental data, use of the landscape. And actually, uh, it provides a more nuanced picture because there, on the one side, there is a, an, uh, a marked decrease in human activity in the landscape, a discontinuity that probably we can relate to the Caesarian campaign in this area. But at the same time, these territories were never completely inhabited, uh, uninhabited. So there was still a, a certain amount of remaining population. Uh, after the war, what we see in this uh, northern area of Gaul is a reorganization of the political landscape, with many of the previous <coughs> names of tribal polities disappearing and new ones 
uh, being formed partly as an immigration from uh, from the east of the Rhine uh, and probably through a, a merging of remaining local people and newcomers. We see the merchants of groups such as the Batavians, but in any case, it was a period of uh, social disruption, huge social stress, and a reconfigura or reconfiguration of the political social landscape in this area. Uh, we see a similar scenario also in northern Spain during Augustus' conquest, one generation after season. Uh, here we have the, uh, the so-called Cantabrian Wars between 29 and 19 BC, uh, where uh, Augustus, which has came, had come to power in Rome, uh, launched an offensive to conquer these last three populations. And probably it was supposed to be a rather triumphal campaign, but it ended up in a major effort that took 10 years and eight, eight legions with auxiliary troops, a minimum of 50,000 soldiers, to control the region. And the general strategy of indigenous communities was to take refuge in fortified places and exert a kind of guerrilla-style warfare against Roman power. We know, uh, archaeologically, uh, we know now that uh, numerous indigenous settlements were violently destroyed, and this is new research just from the last 20 years that has uncovered uh, a large amount of material related to these Cantabrian wars. Uh, at the site of Monte Bernorio, uh, we see one of the major events of this military campaign. This is a large oppidum uh, that I have been excavating the last years with my colleague Jesus Torres Martinez. Uh, 90 hectares of enclosed space that were uh, uh, that were attacked by the Roman army in the 20s BC. We have a Roman military camp here of 40 hectares, huge size, uh, and then the Roman attack to the Oppidum. The uh, excavations have determined that the last occupation layers uh, showed that uh, traces of a violent destruction by fire, uh, and uh, we also find uh, huge amounts of Roman military finds inside the Oppidum showing the direct Roman attack coming through the southern part. Uh, so here we have an episode with probably thousands of people involved, and after the Roman conquest, the site <coughs> was abandoned and never resettled. Uh, here, dramatic uh, reconstruction uh, from a Spanish magazine that was published earlier this year, uh, just to show uh, that this was a major military event. After the war, uh, we see several episodes of rebellions, both in northern Gaul and northern Iberia, um, uh, in Gaul starting in the decades after Caesar's conquest and going up to the late first century AD, uh, but always uh, short-term uh, short uh, episodes of rebellion followed by larger periods of peace. So uh, generally speaking, when you can imagine a range of reactions uh, by different uh, indigenous communities or individuals or families, uh, that resembles in a way that what we can see in more uh, re uh, modern phenomena from enthusiastic welcome to partial acceptance, passive resistance or open hostility. And also we see the fluidity of alliances and how they change over time. Uh, in this regard, it's interesting to note who was actually leading the rebellions, because in the first century AD, uh, most of the uh, military rebellions were led by natives who enjoyed uh, Roman citizenship and who had often already held positions of responsibility in the Roman administration. This is similar to what we observe also in the modern period in numerous anti-colonial rewards uh, that were led by natives that had received a European uh, education. So in a way we can say that we have bi kind of bilingual individuals that were able to operate in two cultural environments and therefore they were best qualified to, uh, to uh, lead these acts of resistance against uh, imperial powers. An example uh, of this is Julius Civilis, the leader of the Batavian uprising in uh, 69 AD. Uh, when he instigated the rebellion, he kind of rediscovered his indigenous roots, and we, uh, we see some elements of this um, in the written sources, for example, the conspiracy being held in a sacred forest, or he dyeing his head red uh, to make himself uh, appear more Germanic according to uh, Roman stereotypes and swearing to let it grow until the legions had been uh, destroyed. Uh, these attempts were unsuccessful, but nonetheless, they reflect these tensions that we see in, not only during the conquest, but also as I have tried to show here before uh, and afterwards. And with this, uh, I'd like to finish with a picture uh, from Rembrandt uh, about Julius Civilis, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>